All right, so let's turn a little bit to the metastatic setting uh, and talk a little bit about uh, drugs that have been used for metastatic disease. And one of them that has kind of, we talk about somewhat, is arubulin. Um, are you guys specifically using arubulin for triple negatives, or are you just using it for everybody, or for nobody? Uh, Everybody, I'm using yeah. it for every everybody. It's yeah. a very highly non-cross resistant drug. I think we all appreciate that now. It really truly is a that new drug we needed after the anticycline, taxane, capecitabine, and now we have a really non-cross resistant drug, both in the ER positive and the triple negative. And of course, the study 301, the huge 1,100 patient randomized trial after anthocycline and taxane pretreatment, capecitabine versus aribulin, kind of on the money, the same level of eff efficacy for the for the two. Uh, agents, and then intriguingly in the subset analysis of the triple negative, about a five-month improvement in overall survival in favor of the aribulin. You know, to your point, Christy, about you know the fact that capecitabine and that was only about a nine, ten-month overall survival in the metastatic setting. Um, but who knows? Maybe we're really selecting for very, very heavily pretreated mesenchymal biology in the um, in the metastatic setting. But yeah, aribulin is very uh, non-cross resistant. And then at San Antonio, there was the quality of life assessment course was very carefully done because that's important in a lot of part of the world, you know, in terms of getting reimbursement for the drug. And um, the aribulin had superior global quality of life and cognitive quality of life compared to capecitabine, but capecitabine had greater emotional quality of life because of the lack of hair loss. Right. So, but, you know, still, um, and every everybody's, you know, level of tumor burden kind of symptoms Im improved to on both arms of the, of the trial. So, it, it definitely is a very um, Im important, so I use it for both ER positive and, and I've negative. used it as a rescue drug in situations, you know, particularly when it got approved, and even now, you know, when nothing else is working very well. I yeah. mean, I also use gem platinum combinations in that setting, but uh, aribulin is an interesting drug, and I have to say, you know, there's always a learning curve, right? So now I've learned how to give it in those rescue situations, which is not at full dose or even half dose sometimes, because I've caused, you know, grade three mucositis, which I hadn't seen in a long, long time prior to giving aribulin. It's such a little milligram per meter squared, <laughs> but it makes a big difference, you know, 1.4, right? Yes. So even, you know, I've given people 0.4 and 0.6 and, you know, gone up by 0.1 milligram each cycle to try and get it in and had it be, you know, a, a treatment which works when people's livers are failing and gives them mm -hmm. another eight months of life. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, it's really a big data, data on that, too. It? How do you dose it in liver failure, by the way? They've looked very at this low dose. In, in the package insert, which is very, <laughs> very helpful. Pack, I've looked at the, I can't really, I mean, I've seen the package insert. I'm just trying to figure it out, though. Yeah, because it looks at the child Pew score, but the right, bottom so really line the is, score. Yeah, I go by the Billy Rubin. I go by the Billy, and basically you can give it, but... I think it's a little too aggressive in the packet. The bottom line is, I agree. Cut the dose right in half at the most if the if the bilirubin yeah. is is elevated at the if most. You, I've given it to people with bilirubins of you know six and seven, but you know then you should really be giving point way four down. because way and down. you still are going to get mucositis. Yeah. and it's really pretty impressive. But it works. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I agree. No, and we don't. You know, and I guess the question is. What's the mechanism of why? I mean, you know, you talk about mesenchymal disease. You think mm -hmm. it's preferential against mesenchymal disease? There's preclinical data to support that, actually, because it gets not only the mitotic spindle, right. it gets the leading invasive edges. It's the leading edge of the microtubules that have to really form to, to invade and yeah, metastasize. Good point. And it's also got anti-angiogenic effects as well. So there's a lot of preclinical data. They actually looked at... Um, pick 3 ca mutations in clinical uh, cell lines, et cetera. So there's a fair amount of data that it um, will inhibit, you know, e-coherin negative cell lines, et cetera. So it's, it's interesting. So that's before we get to immunotherapy, which is the hot topic, you know, and we have one of the people who was one of the PIs of the immunotherapy studies here next to me, who we'll talk about it in a minute. But more importantly, are you guys thinking about using, you know, the molecular characterization of triple negative disease? You know, the stuff that was done by Jennifer Peter Paul. Well, let me just make one ago. point, which is that Tiffany Trena at, uh, at Memorial, uh, you know, ran a study which we participated in our Translational Breast Cancer Research Consortium giving bicalutamide to patients who had AR positive disease. And, you know, it's very hard to find those patients because the antibody they were using made it really hard. And we didn't know then how to pick the people who might right. be more AR. Now we know, right? Most of the people we test are going to be positive because we pick out the indolent people. So we treated those patients. We didn't have anybody respond, but they had some long, we know the data and you know, there was 
a low level but reasonable response. She went back and did that characterization. Not a single one of them was LAR. They were all really? basal like. Yeah. Really? So I was like, oh, well, good. Wow, oh, what well. we thought we understood, we do not understand. <laughs> Maybe that's why they didn't respond. Maybe they have to be, uh, they have no, to be LAR. The people who responded were not LAR. So were there any LARs that they found? <laughs> I think there were a few, but, but there was most a small of them trial. were still like 30 basal. Patients, 30, 40 no, well, we were... screened a ton of people. So anyway, it was fascinating. And so we may they're going to look at it with necessary. the medivation study, too. But I think it's really uh, fascinating.